This video was made possible by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So today I will be turning just some completely average dirt into the incredibly beautiful and tremendously useful elemental silicon through some really interesting reactions on a scale never shown before on YouTube. Some of you might recall that I did pretty much this exact thing a year ago for my silane project, however this time I will use a slightly different process and improve on a lot of my previous mistakes to make a ton of pure silicon to use for my next gigantic project. Anyway, silicon is a very useful element, chemically it's very similar to carbon, but unlike carbon it's just gorgeous in its elemental form, taking on the appearance of this sparkly crystalline material. It's used in a ton of different things, ranging from useful alloys to car parts or silicones. However, its most important modern use is as a material for integrated circuits. Every chip on your phone or computer contains some silicone on which all its components are printed and you couldn't watch this video without it. I plan to use it to make one of the coolest gemstones there are and this will take me on a big, few videos long journey, all of which begins with dirt. Dirt, otherwise known as ground or soil, is the thing every human on this planet is really familiar with and except for walking and growing plants on it, pretty much no one ever gives it more thought. It turns out that the dirt we are also used to contains a gigantic amount of silicon, mainly in the form of silicon dioxide. Silicon actually makes up around 28% of the whole Earth's crust by mass, so it's incredibly abundant. Except for in dirt, it is also often found in many rocks and sands, which would also be great candidates for this project, but since there are a few rocks and almost no pure sand where I live, I settled on the good old dirt. Now, as with nearly every one of my videos, I could of course skip the whole time consuming and challenging part and just buy the end product, which in this case is silicon. I actually own a kilo of it, which is so pure I could use it to make a computer, but I won't involve it in this project because I think that chemistry is more about the journey than the final result and these conversions are always a lot of fun and make lots of people learn something new. Ok, so to start extracting elemental silicon from dirt, I first have to remove the dirty part from it, since for the silicon making process purity matters greatly. The dirt where I live is this very low grade sandy one which will be really good for this project, to get some silicon dioxide, or in other words sand from it, I need to remove all the organic, mineral and living components. However, before I do that, I really want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an advanced all-in-one website creation platform made to allow entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Using it, you can create incredible websites with ease, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, and use them to sell anything from regular products to your time or skills. Squarespace gives you access to amazing features like their new option for creating and selling your own online courses, with the ability to customize everything through their next generation editing technology and set up many payment options, courses are a great way to generate steady income. Squarespace also provides you with useful analytics tools that help you monitor your performance, as well as their flexible payments that make checkout seamless to customers, which in my opinion is just awesome. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, to get my silicon dioxide, I first have to extract some really pure sand from dirt, and to do that, I first need to do something which is a lab goblin I rarely do, and that is going outside. As the next step, I have to collect some raw dirt, and for that I chose the same exact spot as in my last silicon extraction project, and with the help of a bucket and a shovel, collected an arbitrary amount of some plain old dirt. It's quite funny how the chemical and normal worlds overlap here, since I am really just shoveling some random dirt into a bucket like millions of other people, but this time with the intention of turning it into a real gemstone. Anyway, when I filled up the bucket, I covered the created hole so that my experiments caused less damage to the environment, and now before starting to extract the silicon dioxide, I wanted to improve on the last time I did that and first dry the dirt. 
This will make it much easier to clean from any larger rocks and roots and should really ease the sieving later on. To start I got my big black plastic tray onto the scorching summer sun and filled it up with the dirt. The black plastic absorbs a ton of light turning it into heat which quickly drives off all the moisture from my dirt and after just a few hours everything was bone dry. I brought the tray into the lab since outside it was way too bright for my camera. I then manually got out all the larger rocks and other stuff contaminating my dirt. I also measured its temperature and it turns out that the Genius Tray Sun Heater 5000 was really efficient, heating up the dirt to 40 degrees Celsius for free. Now to further purify the silicon dioxide I have to pass all this dirt through a seed which is a rather tedious process that produces copious amounts of this dirt dust which behaves kind of like a gas and it's honestly quite interesting that not even halfway into this project I created some nasty lung and background destroying thing. Anyway when I was done using the sieve I was now left with a plastic container full of some pure laboratory dirt and about half a bucket worth of some unidentified dirt contaminants which I got rid of in the most responsible way possible. I now have to remove all the contaminants stuck to my precious sand and the best way to do that is to wash everything with a ton of water. This unfortunately won't be 100% efficient but it's just an initial cleaning step serving to ease the real purification later. Anyway to start I got the purified dirt container outside to the place of doom where all the messy experiments take place and started to wash it using a garden hose. The dry dirt had a really hard time getting wet and when it finally did I realized I just synthesized some real nice mud which gave me flashbacks of my early childhood and I bet that past me would never have guessed that one day I would be making mud for science. I continued washing the dirt which consisted pretty much of just filling the container up with water, swirling the dirt around and draining the muddy water. I must have repeated this process like 50 times since the dirt was so dirty it just refused to cooperate. This whole endeavor resulted in a local flood of muddy water and after what felt like forever the contents of the container looked more like sand and the water got considerably cleaner. This process got rid of pretty much all the organic and lightweight stuff as well as a ton of this incredibly fine dirt dust which settled on the concrete becoming some low grade clay. The dirt now turned into this perfectly average sand which was a little darker than what you would normally find. It was decently pure but since I want my future silicon to be as pure as possible I had to perform one last cleaning step and that is to wash it with some acid. The acid should destroy everything except the silicon dioxide purifying it and my acid of choice in this case was some 98% sulfuric acid which I have a ton of made from a car battery. However hydrochloric acid could also be used here and it would work just as well and maybe even a bit better. I added 50 milliliters of the sulfuric acid onto the sand and diluted everything down with some distilled water. I then swirled this mixture around to evenly distribute the acid and left it to marinate overnight. When I came back the water got visibly dirty which was a really good sign of the acid doing its job. The sand was now a little whiter and felt more runny for some reason. I now had to wash it one more time and before doing that I neutralized all the leftover acid with some baking soda to make the future flood more eco-friendly. I then got everything outside and again washed the sand with an ungodly amount of water. When I was done the sand looked much better than before and nothing like the starting dirt. It should be now composed of nearly pure silicon dioxide and now it's time to finally move on from playing with dirt to doing some actual chemistry with this extra pure scientific sand. To turn it into silicon I have to process it a little more and to start I dried it on my big black tray in the sun exactly like the dirt before. It got bone dry in no time and I again got it into my trusty plastic container. It now looks like the plainest, most average sand and that's exactly what I wanted to achieve. Now before weighing it I wanted to see if there were any magnetic particles present since I can get those out using a magnet and slightly increase my sun's purity. I got my largest and beefiest neodymium magnet and swirled it around in the sun for a while. It turns out that indeed there are quite a lot of these small magnetic rust particles present that somehow survived the acid treatment. 
I got most of them out by really beating the sand up with the magnet and there was actually quite a bit of this rusty material in it, which I might use in the future for some experiments. Anyway, with my sand now iron free and incredibly clean, I wanted to weigh it, which I did in portions, while pouring it through a sieve to catch any stray plant matter that might have fallen into it when it was laying on the tray outside. My final yield turned out to be 4,988 grams, which is nearly 5 kilos, and it's actually pretty damn high. I expected to get much less from the amount of dirt I processed, and this just goes to show how bad this soil where I live is. Anyway, with the sand now ready, I can start making the silicon. I will do that through the same method as before, and that is a modified fermite reaction, which while producing enough heat to greatly contribute to global warming, rips the oxygen atoms of the silicon dioxide, turning it into elemental silicon. The efficiency of this process greatly depends on how finely powdered its ingredients are, and since my sand is well sand, I have to pulverize it. To make it into a fine powder, I could use something like a mortar, but that would take forever, so exactly like in my last video, I turned to the only feasible option, which is my good old DIY ball meal. It turns everything into a powder by smashing it against big steel balls and should make my sand into some real fine dirt flour. To start it up, I first had to measure out how much sand I wanted to grind and there was no way I would be processing the whole 5 kilos, so I settled on 1 kilogram instead, which is still orders of magnitude more than the last time. I actually weighed out 1050 grams of the sand to account for any losses during the milling and got the rest into these big plastic bottles to use for some different experiments later. Anyway, to begin the milling process, I got two of my masterfully modified coffee cans and filled them up with some steel balls. I then got about half of the 1050 grams of sand to each and sealed them up using some tape. I then got my beautiful ball meal and placed the cans onto it. I then turned it on and as always was surprised by how loud it was. I let it run for two days and when the time was up my sand should now be ready. To check how fine it is now, I got the cans of the meal and opened them. The golden one milled the sand into this ultra fine powder which was very nice to see. The other one however didn't do such a good job, but since the average grain size was now much smaller than before, I was happy with the results. I mixed all the milled sand together and waited. The whole milling process somehow added a whole 2 grams to the total sand weight, which was weird to say the least, but this is probably just some moisture or something, and I just chalked it up to a gift from the chemistry gods. Anyway, now I can finally make my silicone, and for the reaction to work, apart from my lab sand, I will need some sulfur and aluminum powders. To react my whole 1052 grams of sand, I ended up needing 1402 grams of sulfur and a whopping 1169 grams of powdered aluminum, which I had to scavenge my lab for, and that's why you see different kinds of powders in this beaker. Finally, powdered aluminum is absolutely required for this reaction, and it's very rare and expensive to buy where I live, so I sold my other kidney to be able to afford it all. Anyway, I got all the ingredients into a plastic container to mix them, and for that I used my new and gorgeous plastic spatula. This process really took forever, and since it's on a such big scale, I felt like I was running some sort of a thermite factory. After about half an hour, the powders were now pretty evenly mixed, and it was honestly pretty scary to see 3.5 kilos of a thermite mix in one place. Now it's time to light this thing up and finally make some silicone, I couldn't do it inside for reasons that will become clear later, so instead I again got outside to the place of doom. I decided to ignite the thermite in this old grill. I was afraid that it would eat right through it, so I used one of the previously made bottles of sand to make a comfy thermite bed. When it was ready, I started making a big mountain of the thermite mix using my spatula, which didn't do too great of a job, so in the end I decided to just dump it all in. Now with my thermite mountain ready, it was time to light this thing up. To do that, I placed a small shaving of magnesium metal on top of the thermite mountain like a flag, and then proceeded to ignite it using my blowtorch. It served as a fuse, allowing me to safely run away. At first, things were rather smoothly, producing a moderate amount of flames and smoke, 
but after a few seconds the whole thing caught on fire, melting it all together and producing a gigantic and incredibly bright flame along with tones of this white smoke. The reactions going on here are rather simple, at first the sulfur reacts with some of the aluminum producing aluminum sulfide which doesn't do anything to the silicon dioxide but produces enough heat to keep the second more important reaction going. In it the aluminum reduces silicon dioxide to elemental silicon itself becoming aluminum oxide. This process is known as a fermite reaction and it is a very useful thing normally performed using iron oxide and aluminum to produce molten iron used to for example weld together railways. This fermite reaction is quite special because on its own it can produce enough heat to sustain itself and that's why it requires sulfur or other thing compatible with aluminum to heat it up enough. These two reactions together produce enough heat to keep everything molten and glowing white, you can even see that when some of the reaction mixture spilled onto the concrete below the flaming grill. Anyway, after a few minutes of literal hell, everything seemed to slow down revealing the nice and flat glowing puddle of silicon, aluminum oxide and aluminum sulfide. Also, now the main issue associated with this sulfur involving method started to show, because aluminum sulfide is easily decomposed by water to the unbelievably deadly and stinky hydrogen sulfide. Thankfully now the smell wasn't too overpowering, but still everywhere near the grill you could smell some rotten eggs. This rotten egg smell actually gave me the idea to use the remaining heat of this molten slab to cook something. To do that I got an old and already destroyed frying pan and it really nicely fit onto this innovative stove. I thought that the only fitting thing for this project that I can cook on it is an egg, so I cracked one on the pan and it started cooking almost immediately. The few hundred degrees heat of the slab cooked the egg in a record time, now giving me something to eat while I waited for this thing to cool down. It's quite funny how past me never thought about using dirt for science, but never in a million years imagined I would turn it into some stinky lava and use it to cook an egg. Anyway, after about an hour, the slab completely solidified and cooled down enough to start processing it. To get the silicon out, I have to selectively dissolve the aluminum sulfide encasing it, and this can be done by just soaking everything in some water. First, however, I had to get the slab out of the grill, which at first seemed rather hard, but fortunately, after flipping the grill over and using some finesse, everything fell right out. The protective sand now turned black for some reason and I had to dig out the slab from it like some sort of an archaeology project. Its texture and the sounds it made really reminded me of ceramic and before dissolving away all the aluminum sulfide I had to break it up into smaller pieces so that it can fit in my bucket. To do that I used my gigantic hammer which combined with the slab being rather brittle made quick work of it. It already uncovered some pretty silicon crystals and I just couldn't wait to see the silicon blobs in their full glory. To start the cleaning process I got the whole crushed slab into my good old bucket and poured in another bucket worth of water. Almost immediately after the addition a ton of gas bubbles started being emitted and a horrible stench filled the entire area. The reaction going on here turns aluminum sulfide into aluminum hydroxide and hydrogen sulfide which is really smelly and really deadly. I wore a good gas mask for the entire duration of this process to not kill myself because hydrogen sulfide has this fun property of losing all its smell if the concentration gets too high. Anyway, the reaction only seemed to get more and more vigorous looking like some kind of an evil witch's cauldron. It also produced enough heat to make the water boil which made it even more angry than it already was. When everything calmed down, I drained away most of the now very dirty water and washed the remaining sludge with some more water. I repeated this process a few times and then poured in some concentrated hydrochloric acid to destroy any remaining aluminum sulfide. I then diluted the acid down with even more water and transferred it into a plastic bucket since the acid would damage the metal one and left this mixture to react overnight. When I came back in the morning, I brought the now much less stinky bucket into my lab and got rid of all the dirty acid water to reveal a ton of nice silicon blobs. I got all of them into a metal bowl and washed them with a copious amount of water, which made all the silicon even prettier than before. Now, to get rid of most of the remaining sand and aluminum oxide, I got this whole mixture into a sieve and again washed it with a ton of water. 
This left me with two kinds of crude silicone. The first was undoubtedly the prettier one with beautiful and clean silicone blobs, while the second one was just some sand mixed with tiny silicone particles, which I probably won't use for anything, but decided to still process. Speaking of processing, now it's time to do a final cleaning step. It's not mandatory, but I still did it just to get that few percent of purity. It involves using an ultrasonic cleaner to thoroughly clean the silicone blobs of anything sticking to their surface by blasting the water surrounding them with a very specific sound frequency. To carry it out, I got my trusty ultrasonic cleaner and inserted the silicone beakers into it. I left the system to work for about an hour at 50 degrees Celsius to really make sure the silicone was as clean as possible. When the hour was up, I got the beakers out and it indeed seemed that the ultrasonic cleaner got a lot of impurities dislodged from the silicone, I then got rid of the dirty water and now it's time to dry and weigh my product. To dry it I just got all the silicone beads onto a baking tray and put them into my oven for a few hours. When they got bone dry, I sorted them by grain size and I was just amazed by how much silicone I managed to make. I also dried the silicone sand which as I already said is quite useless to me. Also here you can see some small pieces of aluminum oxide I meticulously picked out of the pure silicone using a pair of tweezers and I also probably won't have any use for them. Anyway, when it comes to the purity of my silicone, it's probably quite high since there are a lot of these cool sparkly crystals. However, it's definitely not perfectly pure, since the blobs still smell like rotten eggs and upon weighing all of them I found out that I got a 96% yield from the starting sand, which is a little too good to be true. I was really mesmerized by all these beautiful chunks of silicone and stared at them for a really long time. I also wondered how they looked polished, so I took the biggest one and with some great struggle managed to make one of its sides look like a pretty mirror reminiscent of Swiss cheese and it's actually quite nice that you can see the beautiful crystal structure of this thing. Anyway, I will use most of my homemade silicone in the next video for this big mystery project of mine and let me tell you, it will be quite the ride. For now I have to thank you all very much for watching this quite cool and stinky project. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did you can like it, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you are feeling extra generous and want to see some content unsuitable for YouTube, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also as always special thanks go to all my wonderful Patreons for their support and making videos like this possible and see you guys in the next video.